Hello everyone, and welcome to today's session of the Stormforge Fireside Podcast. Uh, this week, we have a slew of guests as we are talking about pain points, we're talking about their identification, and how they lead to solutions and products and all sorts of various things. Uh, I, as always, am your co-host, Noah Abrahams, open source advocate here at Stormforge, and my other co-host. Cody Crutchington, uh, leading professional services and customer success at Stormforge. And with us today, we have, as a pleasure, Mike Fuller, co-author of this wonderful book, Cloud FinOps, and the uh, chair of the Technical Advisory Committee, is that correct, of the FinOps Foundation? Yeah, Technical Advisory Council. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, Mike? Yeah, my name is Mike Fuller. I'm a principal engineer at Atlassian. I've been there for about nine years. I live down here in Australia, so uh, nice and far away from all those people in the US who are hopefully watching. Um, but uh, yeah, so I've been at, been at Atlassian in doing sort of cloud financial management within Atlassian for sort of six, uh, probably seven or eight years now, actually. Um, and um, sort of been active in this space, including the, the FinOps Foundation uh, as an advisory council there and also on the board. And then, um, yeah, of course, co for the book with J.L. Stormont. Fantastic. So we've got a few different guests this week. We've got some vendors, we've got some end users, uh, but you're coming to us as part of a foundation, which is an interesting way for a pain point to manifest itself. So let's start with how that happened. Why does the FinOps Foundation exist? And what was the pain point that that spurred it into existence? What created that? Yeah, so there's a bit of a, a I guess, a little community of uh, you know, public speakers that sort of were always in this space talking about cost optimization back sort of 2015, 2016. Um, you know, and so we all sort of knew each other on the circuit of talking about this, you know, this topic of, uh, you know, optimizing cloud costs and generating cloud savings. And I think that um, we, we sort of collectively understood that, you know, at the end of those sorts of talks, you would, you would be talking about things like reserved instances and committed use discounts and all the sort of levers you could do to save money. And you'd often get people coming up at the end going like they, they get it, they get the levers, but they're trying to figure out how to implement these savings programs within their organizations. And they were struggling to get the, the commitment from the orgs that they were working at to sort of give them the time they needed to pull these levers. And so collectively, we sort of looked, stood back and realized that, that talking about cost optimization is really just one piece of this sort of bigger puzzle that people need to implement um, you know, cost efficiency within an organization. And so um, JR and I got sort of really talking about, you know, if we could get a group of experts that are successful in this space together and build sort of a, a community or a foundation um, to generate sort of the, the best practices, sort of what's common across all these people that are being successful and guide, uh, you know, the people getting started in this space on sort of how they can convince their org to buy in, how they can set up, you know, a team effectively and really talk about the bigger picture of this story of just, um, you know, whereas we, we had been just focusing on that cost optimization piece. So is the FinOps Foundation today, you're, talk, you're talking about cost optimization, is it just about saving money or are there other factors in play that come into all of the visibility that come into all the understanding about your costs. Yeah, so that was you know one of the the big reasons for from moving away from the term cost optimization and choosing to uh, create a, a you know a new term FinOps. We wanted to a sort of separate ourselves a little bit from just this cost optimization uh, you know of of the talks from previous um, past, but also to create sort of this. Um, you know, a, a new sort of word that we could pin sort of this bigger picture story against. And what we've what we were trying to say was that cost optimization will be an outcome of good FinOps practices, but it's not the the you know edges, all all the edges of, of FinOps. FinOps talks about you know cost efficiencies really is the the language we wanted to transition to versus cost savings. Um, and JR does this uh, in a nice little saying um, 
when I hear him talk about the, the idea that the, the dirty little secret of cloud is the cost will always go up. And um, I think what he was trying to say with that is that, uh, you know, that, that quite often that, you know, even though you have really good savings programs within your FinOps teams, that your consumption, your growth, your, your, your you know, development of innovation in, inside the cloud will usually outstrip that amount of savings you're generating. And so while your bill is going up, and you, but you are generating bigger savings, and the only way to really measure that is to look at the actual cost efficiency. How much cloud are you getting for your dollars spent? Okay. Interesting. So, so what are some of the other outcomes of implementing these FinOps practices? How would people go about doing that? Yeah, so within the book, and then I guess within the foundation framework, we talk about this, this journey towards getting to unit economics, um, unit metrics, if you will. And so the idea is to be able to sort of measure what's the business output of your company. And so, you know, within Atlassian, you have monthly active users. If you've got, um, uh, within an airline, it might be like, you know, seats booked and flo you know, flown on an airline and, you know, things like your streaming services would do things like, you know, um, number of streams as their unit. And what we're really trying to work out is how much cloud dollars are we spending in order to generate that business value? Um, and so, you know, cost per, per monthly active user, cost, cost per um, stream. And, you know, when you look at other sort of public talks from, from companies like Netflix and Spotify, their, their unit economics really helps them understand their efficiency of cloud. And that's kind of, I think, you know, what we call the FinOps Nirvana is where, you, where you're able to sort of understand that efficiency. But um, before you get there, really, there's a, there's a lot of value on, along the way of transitioning from just measuring this dollars saved be really focusing on the, the amount of uh, culture you build within the organization. So how much, you know, the, the cost awareness within the org, the cost responsibility, pushing responsibility out to the engineers that generating that cost and getting to that position where you're able to have teams make business decisions about their cloud with cost in mind and balance that good, fast, cheap, um, you know, uh, decision-making process along the way. Like how much, you know, do, do they double down on how good it is, but drive up the cost? Um, what's the business value in that? And, or do they need to drive down the cost because they don't need it to be as, as good as it is currently? You know, maybe it's a, a low tier service and they're maybe over committing on spend on it. So I think that uh, that digs into something else we wanted to ask about um, because you talk about the, you know, there's that, that golden triangle that sort of everybody has for how they want to run the business. And you're saying that it varies wildly. So is there, well, I'm putting words in your mouth there, uh, but is there a particular tipping point for organizations, for a, whether it's a, a whole company or an individual or to say, we've gotten out of balance within the triangle, we have to start taking action. Is there a particular tipping point or does it, does it change drastically? Yeah, that's um, like, if you've heard the horror stories over the years, right, where someone's you know, magically spent some amazing amount of money on cloud because they weren't paying attention to cost. And I think, you know, if we sort of dig into those stories a little bit, the, the main thing that happens there is that they, there's this sort of common story of like, get to the cloud no matter what the cost, or we need to, you know, get this bill out and de delivered to customers, it doesn't matter how much it costs. And this, this doesn't matter how much it costs really has a hidden, uh, you know, um, hidden word when they say that, which is it doesn't matter what reasonable cost is. And that reasonable is like this understanding within the business where, uh, you know, some people believe it's, I don't know, a million dollars a month. Other people think it might be $5 million a month. And quite often there's a handful of people think that it's literally an unlim unlimited amount of money per month. Um, and, and so I guess what happens is eventually you get to that bill shock moment where, where someone within the sort of, you know, finance chain usually uh, picks up the cloud bill and says, well, well, hang on, this is way more than we thought was going to happen with the cloud journey. And then you get the, the, the you know, oh crap moments, the stop doing what you're doing moments, and worst case, the pull back and pull stuff back into the data center uh, moments. And I think, you know, everyone sort of talks about it as the bill shock, but I think really what you're looking at under the hood there is the fact that the company feels like they've lost control of cloud spend. 
they 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 don't know um, you know what to do about this cloud spend. And I think um, when we set out, we thought there was just going to be a dollar figure, like a million a month or percent of revenue or something like that, where you just go once a company hits this value, you have to be doing FinOps. Um, but what we found was a kind of a, a confluence of two diff different things. It was the the dollars figure, yes, it's the the easiest one that you know people see. But under the hood, it's like, how complex is the, the cloud consumption within your organization? If you have one single team that's just deploying everything, a very simple one team to talk to when you're trying to figure out like what's going on with cloud costs, it's a lot easier to see a larger number on that bill without FinOps, because you really just have one, one touch point. If you've got an organization that's gone really down that line of distributed uh, consumption of cloud, the DevOps model with self-service adoption, um, now you have a much more complex conversation around figuring out what's going on with the cloud costs. And so you'll find that you'll, you'll hit this sort of tipping point at a much lower dollar value because you find that you've lost that single point to just ask how much is this going to cost next month? Um, you know, it becomes 100 conversations of how much is this going to cost next month? And you'll get 100 different measured ways of um, you know, answering that question. And so that feeling of we've lost control of the cloud cost is really that tipping point. And hopefully what we're trying to point with the, the FinOps Foundation is that you start this FinOps journey at the same time you start your cloud and develop it as you grow. You can try and avoid this whole tipping point mentality of throwing some you know, emergency measures in at the last minute. So a lot of our customers we find, we talk about, you know, you talked about complex, uh, you know, cloud infrastructure. A lot of our customers that we've spoken to, they find they're now moving from a hybrid cloud scenario because, you know, this uncontrollable cloud spin or just cloud spin that got away from them and they weren't very aware of it. Do you, are you seeing that a lot? Do you feel like that's something that's bringing people because a lot of our customers are either moving back to one cloud provider or they're moving back to the data center. Um, is that something you're seeing quite a bit of? I don't see a lot of it. I definitely hear the stories, you know, that, that they're in the market where they're, you know, they've got out of control costs or they're, they're not confident in the way they can do their journey into cloud or they've gone multi-cloud and really struggle with the balance between what's, you know, reasonable in costs for them. And I think it really just, it just really does come back to that, like, um, setting expectations within the organization for what, what's required by engineers or what's accepted by engineers, the building out as much transparency with across the whole organization of where costs are and getting that as near real time as possible. So the idea, we talk about this um, concept of, we used to still call it the Prius effect, but I think everyone likes the Tesla effect because they're more cool. But uh, the idea was like, if you get this old car and you, know, you, you fill it up with gas and you drive down the freeway, you really, the way you're driving that car, you can't really gauge how much the impact of your, your actions on the car is having is with the efficiency of the fuel um, until you sort of empty the tank and then you can sort of back calculate the miles per gallon. Um, when you get into a nice modern electric vehicle, as soon as you put that foot on the floor, the dashboard shows you that there's a pile of energy run, rushing out of the batteries into the wheels. Um, and so you have this immediate feedback of the way you're driving and the impact it's having on the, on the efficiency of the car. And so when we translate that to cloud costs, we, we want to have it so that when engineers are making decisions, they're getting that feedback as fast as possible, that the, the deployment they did yesterday has increased costs by 30%. And they can then make the decision that, Oh, should, should we, you know, look at that and adjust what we did yesterday or is 30% within the, you know, the expected the, um, outcome of their spend versus waiting till the end of the month and figuring out why the whole bill jumped 50% and trying to figure out which teams to have the conversation with. So, so I think we've got a good understanding of what, what drives them in now from a, from a we've only been speaking for a few minutes standpoint. Um, how does how does the company, how does Nord get started? They've identified that there's these problems, they want to take action. How do, how do you get started? Yeah, so I mean, like the, the I guess the, the foundation salesman in me would say join FinOps.org. But um, the, the reality is, I guess we see sort of two different um, stories, common stories. One, one will be, and, and we believe it's where the pain is felt 
first. So if it's finance are putting pressure on engineering to answer the questions, or if it's the business putting pressure on finance to answer the questions, um, usually someone from finance um, side of the org or engineering side of the org will start with this task of this sort of uh, figuring out the cloud cost. Um, what we recommend is to have you know, a sort of combination of a, an engineer and a finance person within your organization, just starting the conversation with, together, collaborating around what is the right journey for them. You know, you can call it FinOps, you can call it cloud financial management, you can call it your, you know, your cloud economics um, group or whatever. It doesn't really matter what the term is you give this, but it is important that you get someone from the engineering side and finance side of the house to start to collaborate on what's going on with cloud spend and start with the visibility, like bring in the cloud bill, get it as near real time as you can, get the figures out um, across the business so people can see that that's um, you know, the impacts. And so the idea there is it, we, we talk about the phases of FinOps where you have to like an inform, optimize and operate. And I always advocate that we start that inform, we, we're sort of drawing the map and putting the thumb knack in it as where we are, where are we today? Where are we, where's our cloud spend? What's the drivers? Who, which teams are driving our cloud spend every month? Um, what are the services that are the, you know, the most costly services for us? Just building a bit of a lay of the land so you understand where you are. That's a good, definitely the best place to start. How, how granular are you seeing those who implement the FinOps Foundation practices? How granular are they getting with the metrics and determining, uh, you know, we can save here on this service or like you were saying, this development team is, you know, they're the biggest bill, right? How granular are you seeing various orders get? Yeah, so I guess that you, you see at least that, you know, division granularity as far as division costs. So you know which sort of departments, um, the, so the spread of your cloud spend at division level, breaking that down into a service by service. So, you know, you, your company's services within the cloud. Um, makes a big jump in the, the benefits because you're able to figure out which of your services are driving the cost. And also it opens up a much quicker conversation between finance and engineers when you can say that it's that service that's jumped in price, or, you know, we would like to see reductions in the price of this service because we, we don't want to fund it. Um, and, and then, you know, once you get into the service level, being the cloud bill is super granular. It's you know it's like fine sand, and it, sometimes it can be the detriment of of someone's you know lifespan because they take ten years off their life for they're trying to manage this cloud bill that's in you know in the hundreds of millions or billions of lines long. And um, but the benefit of that is you do get the ability to go right down to you know the exact Amazon service, the exact Amazon resource, or the exact Google resource that you know needs to be um, to, to be considered. And so you'll end up with these reports focused on the sort of spend, spend history, spend forecast, but then you'll also start to then generate reports on the optimizations available to you. And this does loop us back and, and focus in on those cost optimization talks from years past, where we're able to actually say, well, now we understand how this sits within the organization and who's involved in talking about it. Now we can bring back those levers in and say, these are the optimizations we have available. Now let's have the conversation on what we do with them. So I would assume all of that is gonna need tooling of various kinds. So has there been preferences in the past for the various members of the FinOps Foundation, whether it's the end users, whether it's the people that are involved, whether it's just people that are looking at it, uh, for uh, going out and finding vendors versus finding open source products versus uh, tooling their own versus just just using the you know the Amazon provided what is it CloudWatch I think uh, um, yeah so. Um, this story really just, it, it goes, for me, the decision process should be driven around the, the time to value. Um, and you'll find that, you know, most often um, people in this space will recommend that you go and talk to vendors because they've got years and years of experience. They've got a very easy onboarding process to get your cloud bill consumed in and get your visibility going. The, the idea is that if it takes you, you know, six to 12 months to build an in-house tool, that six to 12 months where you're really just letting cloud costs go wherever they go until you're building out all those functionalities. Um, and so start with the vendor tooling is a really good starting point because you, you're able to just hit the ground running. You're gonna get recommendations. You're gonna get cost visibility really quick. 
um, then then you know in addition to that and especially as you grow in in the cloud complexity and cloud spend um, the open source tools you know I would see those as the second preference as you grow because you're wanting to look at um, you know ways that you can um, adapt tooling to fit exactly your organization so vendor tooling is great it has a very sort of broad hit but open source tooling then allows you to really customize that start you know hitting the, the corners of the organization that the way you want to work with your cloud spend and the way you want to populate it and um, and then in-house tools you know if you've got the skill set within your organization to build in in-house tools it's the you know where you can get the real most custom you know tooling in place and so definitely important if you've got you know, in-house platforms that allow you to do soft, you know, self-service access to the cloud, or you've got, you know, a particular way you want to be doing, you know, deployments, CIC deployments, and you want to be able to surface things like um, dollar values in those pipelines and stuff like that. And so you, you start to then adapting all of those sort of built in-house tools and reports to bring in FinOps story to that, that conversation. But um, yeah, so it's kind of like, I feel like it, it's not so much a journey that you go from one to the other, but it, it's you implement one and then you, you supplement with other piece parts of the, the puzzle available to you until you've got this real sort of mature mix of a bit of vendor, a bit of in-house and, and some using the open source and improving the open source tools to, to fit your needs, um, to give you the sort of fill all the corners of the story you're trying to tell. Very cool. And I think as a, as a vendor ourselves, I think we really like the idea of start with vendors. <laughs> yeah, um, absolutely. So speaking of which, um, this is part of our lead up to KubeCon. And as a vendor, we're going to have a booth at KubeCon. Uh, so, hey, come visit us. But the FinOps Foundation will not have a booth at KubeCon. So if folks are watching this uh, as part of the lead up and they want to learn more about the foundation, where can they go? What can they do? Yeah, so I, um, hopefully next year we'll have a booth somewhere in some of these expos as the human malware goes away. Um, but uh, the, uh, yeah, finops.org definitely is the right place to start. We've got, you know, um, memberships for uh, practitioners just simply come in and then, um, you know, the vendors, we love to get you involved and, and hear your voice in, in growing this and developing the practice. Um, of course, you mentioned my book earlier, so thanks for that. Um, but yeah, there's, a, there's a, probably the foundation, uh, finops.org website is a really good starting point to, to get connected to everything we're doing over here. Awesome. That leads us into our rapid fire questions. Noah, do you want to run with these or do you want me to? Why don't you go for it? All right. I'm going to do these very quickly. All right. Pineapple on pizza, yes or no? Uh, yeah. So I, I will have pineapple on pizza, but I wouldn't pick pineapple, pineapple on pizza. <laughs> Fair enough. Favorite piece of technology? Ooh. I like my eye devices, but... Um, I think that I really do uh, like the the Raspberry Pi or the you know the, all the Raspberry Pi suite. I think it really has bring in, brought hardware technology and tinkering back into the the life. Yeah, like Radio Shack, right? Like yeah, that stuff in the day. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, favorite open source project. That's an interesting one. Um, oh, actually, probably Linux. I mean. <laughs> the OG, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay, favorite hobby? Uh, I, I play pinball. Um, you know, as a, a a side project, so I really yeah. do enjoy that. Absolutely cool. Um, okay, last one. Favorite place to vacation? Uh, I live out on a property, and I just I love just being out here in the country, away from everyone, and tinkering out in the field. Awesome. That's great. I'm, so I also live, live in the where country. you vacation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I also live in a very rural area, so I can respect that. Fantastic. Well, that's all we got. Thanks for joining us today, Mike. Uh, it's on. been a pleasure talking with you. And yeah. uh, we hope that everyone watching or listening will tune in for our next episode. We'll see you next time.